So uh, thank you for everyone who has joined us so far. Just a reminder that this session is being recorded. Uh, my name is Guilherme. I'm the president for the uh, GBC Analytics Club. Uh, just to give you a brief introduction about uh, who, we are, who we are and what we do. Uh, the Analytics Club was launched on March 30 of last year. Uh, we now have over 150 members uh, to our club. And it is open for any GBC, George Brown College uh, student and alumni that is interested in the analytics industry. Uh, our purpose is to deliver a uh, real-world experience and give our members the opportunity to um, develop and advance their skill sets in business and analytics, and also to create networking opportunities. So we have events uh, such as the speaker series that we are hosting today. Uh, we also have uh, skill learning, uh, competitions, and, and you know some any event that, that helps us or uh, members to advance their careers in analytics. You can keep updated with our events through our LinkedIn. I'm going to post here on the chat box. So we have two groups. Let me just post them here. The first one is only open for GBC students and alumni, but the second one is open for anyone that is interested in the analytics industry. So uh, without further ado, I want to introduce you to our guest, Mr. Francis Silva, who is Bond Brand Loyalties. Uh, VP for Analytics and Technology Practice, uh, delivering innovative, data-driven solutions to solve clients' most complex problems. Uh, he has a, ver a variety background in drawing upon his experience in data engineering, uh, data science, application development, and product and project management. Uh, Francis has always ensured that the solution provided the, just doesn't answer the, uh, what the client wants, but also what their business needs. Uh, before joining Bond, he led the analytics and technology practice within Loyalty Once uh, International Consulting Group. And before that, he was director for Love Loves and Shoppers Drug Market, where he held various roles, uh, bringing the two retails together and overseeing the supply and chain uh, technology for both companies. So uh, given his background and all his uh, work experience, I think it's going to be a very interesting presentation. And Francis, you're welcome to start. All right. OK, thank you. Um, all right, so today um, I'm going to take you guys through a couple different areas. So um, today in this talk, uh, it's kind of free flowing. There's a couple key sections here. Um, you know, when uh, Google Aram and team uh, reached out and asked, hey, listen, can you talk a bit about what you do in analytics? I thought a, a good way to do this would be, you know, quick introduction of myself and then answer any questions on, um, on, on what I do but really talk about what my team does um, specifically within the marketing analytics space and then talk about, you know, some of the tips required to jump into landing a, a role in, in analytics specifically. Um, I know from this program, there's a lot of folks who are looking to get into um, marketing analytics. So those are kind of the key areas I'll touch on throughout this period of time. Any questions that you have, feel free to ask, feel free to jump in um, and ask them and then um, I'll be sure to answer them. So, so with that, I'll jump right in. So who am I? Um, I am, as you can see there, so or as we mentioned, I work for a company called Bond. We are in the customer engagement and loyalty marketing space. Specifically, I lead our analytics and technology uh, teams. Um, what we do here at Bond is effectively build loyalty and customer engagement programs. So think of some of the, you know, the, you know some of the big names in loyalty that you know today. A lot of our uh, technology and a lot of our teams actually support those. So think of the scene program as an example. Um, my work consists of predominantly um, strategy work now, but my teams are responsible from everything from building out platforms um, and the technology and administering that technology to doing the analytics that report on effectiveness of uh, campaigns, effectiveness of offers, um, as well as identifying customers and uh, best customers. As you can see there, there's a, a host of other brands there I've been lucky enough to work with. Um, and prior to Bond, I worked for um, Loyalty One, so that was Air Miles. Um, and then previous to that was Loblaw and Shoppers Drug Mart. So a varied career, um, mostly in technology and analytics and retail. Um, and then very recently, or at least in my last few roles, uh, more in a consultative um, role. Any questions on my background before I jump into um, some of the content? Okay, great. Sorry, Francis, if anyone wants to type in the chat box, I can read it for you as well. Yeah, that's great. Um, so like I said, I didn't want to spend 
a ton of time on my background. I thought it would be important to talk about what my team does, and then I can um, kind of parlay that into how I've seen the industry change. So the first thing I want to touch on was the evolution of specialized analytics rules. So many, you know, many folks within different analytics uh, programs today are, are asking, well, what, what, you know, what type of roles are there um, in the analytics field? And what's ended up happening is in the past, we had a lot of um, people who wear many hats. You could be business facing and find insights, um, but you'd have to also do your own data cleansing and your own feature selection with your data, as well as build your own models. Um, however, today, that's not really the case anymore. Today, we have a lot of specialized roles, specifically these three areas, and I'm going to touch on them in a little more depth. But you have business analytics, which is, as you can imagine, it's the, it's the business side of analytics, so really making sure that uh, customers and clients are understanding the value of those insights, and you're able to take those insights and do something with them. Data engineering, and data engineering has become really big with the advent of big data because ultimately you have to be able to ingest all of this data about customers and then be able to transform it in a way that makes it usable for your data science teams. The people who are actually taking um, that data and producing models that then pop out different types of insights, whether it be model scores, something about like a churn score or a segmentation or a, some sort of um, uh, inferential statistics where you're understanding um, things about the customers or understanding key drivers of a specific behavior. So those are kind of the three areas that we've seen specialize. And then to even go a little more granular, um, as I mentioned, data engineering is really responsible for data storage and quality, right? So making sure the data that you have in your organization is usable. So traditionally, a lot of data engineers, and on the next slide, I'll, I'll go into more depth about, you know, what data or what's the background of data engineers. But traditionally, data engineers have been, um, or data engineering has been part of just the work that someone in analytics does, whereas now it's become a separate function. Uh, data scientists and machine learning engineers, so they're responsible for methodologies and building models using that clean data. So here at Bond, we have a machine learning engineering team. Um, the reason it's machine learning engineering and not data science is because their, their role is to not only build models, but take those models into production, create them at scale. And so machine learning engineering um, is that practice as opposed to data science, which is more tactical, ad hoc, building out models. And in the last bucket, um, business um, analysts slash data consultants, they're responsible for the last mile of analytics delivery. So if you think about deliverables to a client, so pitching it back to a client or, or presenting your results, as well as informing tactics and strategy. So you found your best customers, you figured out what's driving churn in your business, what do you do about them? Or what do you do about it? And that's where um, this last group uh, um, plays. Do those three buckets make sense? So as I think about my team and I think about, you know, as, as I dive deeper into what this really means for us, um, at Bond, we've actually got um, five different, you know, air, key areas. And I'll touch on them really quickly, and I'll touch on the types of roles as well as the types of skills. So I'll actually start from left to right. And so um, data solutions, we have a data solutions team, um, and they do great work specifically around managing our data products as well as go-to-market strategy and collateral. So understanding what, where is the business value of these data, effectively of these pro productized analytics um, in the market. Typical roles are product analysts, product managers, um, and um, normally they, they have skills in product management and project management as well as business casing. So these are the types of people who are really uh, focused in on productizing what we have in our business as well as building a business case around why we should be investing in it. And then as I mentioned on the previous slide, when you think about um, some of the heavy lifting that comes with analytics and so, one of, some of the roles that traditionally weren't here, specifically data engineering and data science, um, these roles provide technical leadership. So as I mentioned previously, data engineering is really responsible for ingesting that data and data science is responsible for building data and uh, productionizing them. And so you'll see here, typical roles include data engineer, uh, data scientist, machine learning engineer. And then some of those key skills, so Python um, usually have a background in some sort of software engineering or computer engineering. On the, when you, 
skew closer to data science, machine learning, engineering, then you're getting closer to PhD research as well as statistics and astrophysics uh, backgrounds. Our head of machine learning engineering uh, is a PhD in uh, astrophysics. So it just gives you a sense of like the types of um, people in these roles, very technical, um, but also uh, very much um, have experience in research and development as well. Client analytics, as I touched on earlier, this is our true last mile delivery. And, and client analytics is really responsible for delivering the insights or the so what out of the, out of the model. So as I mentioned, whether it's the churn score or whether it's identifying your best customers, they figure out what to do next, package it up into a PowerPoint, could be into whatever type of deliverable into a presentation, and then bring that to the client. And then ultimately their role is to turn that insight into some sort of strategy and tactic that can end up uh, influencing a customer's behavior. And you'll see here the skill set's different. SQL, statistics, client management, business analysis, less on the pure technical that you get in data engineering and data science, and more on the soft skills related to business management. So when you think about your program here um, at George Brown, part of this is understanding the client management business analysis um, components, but also making sure you have the standard SQL background or the foundational SQL that allows you to use some of the data that comes out of the analysis. Ultimately, you're not building models like the data scientists or you're not building um, data pipelines like the data engineers, but you need to be able to manipulate some of the data to be able to answer your own questions or answer your own hypothesis. Strategic analytics, and so this is a group that we have that effectively is responsible for analytic strategy. So when you think about a business or a client and they're asking you, hey, what should my investment strategy be around analytics? What should my next investment be? This is where it comes into play. And this is very much, it's a, it's a different skill set than obviously data engineering and data science. And this is very much skewed towards the business side of analytics. Uh, and so there's usually less manipulation of data, less insights, um, less manipulation of insights and more understanding the business, understanding trends in the marketplace um, and understanding what your competitors are doing. And you can see their typical roles are a bit different, um, usually lots of consultants. And then similar skill sets to client analytics, but like I mentioned, less, uh, less, uh, less uh, insights driven and less uh, data manipulation. And then lastly, I'm not gonna touch on this too much just because you know, it's probably not super relevant today, but analytics operations. So how do you make this whole machine run, right? Because we have different people here. And as I mentioned on the previous slide, data engineering, goes to data science, goes to client analytics, last strategic analytics. How do you make that workflow flow? Um, part of it is you have your data solutions who productize your analytics, but your analytics operations people are, you know, think of them as the, the process people in between making sure things are flowing uh, accurately. Um, I wanted to pause there and take a moment to see if there were any questions on the types of roles and types of things that we do. Um, I'm just going to ask you a question, Francis. Um, speaking about my, my colleagues, uh, what I've seen, there is like a vast background. There's a lot of people uh, who are very good at Python, very good at SQL, very good at programming. And at the same time, there's some people who are only at beginners are not that great in, in programming tools. Uh, I wanted to know, is someone starting a career as an analyst, uh, you know, getting their first job in, in this kind of role, do you think they, uh, how much do they have to know about, uh, about SQL, about Python? Can, can they learn it on the job or do you want someone who, you know, it's already great at Python, great at, at SQL? Yeah, it's a great question. So I'll, I'll tackle that two places. So one is when you think about Python, Python for us, you know, really resides in our more technical teams like data engineering and data science. And as I mentioned, um, as those roles gravitate to more technical or more technical fluency, you usually have people who are coming out of software engineering and computer engineering or some sort of advanced uh, degree in STEM. And so they usually have some of that technical ability already, right? Even if you were in um, astrophysics, as an example, odds are is that you were coding in Python or some other uh, language to be able to ingest uh, data and then do some analysis on it, whether it's R or Python or whatever it is. Um, and so they usually come in with those skills and we expect them to have those skills. On the client analytics and strategic analytics side, um, it varies. Now, we've started to look more and more for people with foundational SQL skills, only because the amount of data that you end up looking at, whether it's outputs from data science. So imagine we create a model that tells you um, every customer in our program or in the database um, tells you their average um, expected value. 
right? So how much do we think that we're, they're going to spend next year? And so, you, you know, you're trying to figure out, well, I want to know the average by province. And so that's actually a pretty simple SQL statement. But if you aren't able to write that, you're not able to get that, you're not able to then you know, use that insight. And so we look for very basic SQL skills, as you know, many of you know, you can probably Google, as long as you know the syntax, you can probably Google most of it um, to get what you need. And so understanding the basic syntax of SQL is usually where we, um, w uh, what we're looking for in both client and strategic analytics. The rest of it, obviously, as I mentioned, we can teach um, if someone needed to be more proficient in there, um, as well as obviously, you know, Google is your friend in this case. Python, like our client analytics teams are pretty fluent in Python as well, but it's not mandatory usually um, specifically when it, when it comes to consulting engagements. So we do a lot of external consulting. So imagine a retailer is looking at us and they say, hey, listen, we want you to ingest our data, all of our customer data, and tell us about our best customers and give us a strategy on how to engage them. We would do that. And usually those teams are using Python uh, for most of that ingestion process. Great question. Any other questions? Okay. So talked about some of the roles on the team. Um, what is it going to touch on what it is that you know we do in analytics? And I'm going to focus in on marketing analytics just to kind of constrain the scope. Um, and this is for the most part where we operate here uh, in here at Bond. And um, here's the areas of marketing analytics that I'll touch on. So there's three key areas for us. One is customer analytics. And so think about understanding your customer. The second is product analytics. And so in marketing, you talk about optimizing price and place of product. And then finally, promotions and campaign analytics. And this is really around, okay, well, um, what are the types of campaigns or promotions or um, you know, sales that we should have? Um, what should the offers be. So for those of you um, with uh, PC Optimum card as an example, you get offers for different types of food and each of those offers have different uh, a different number of points associated uh, to them and you get different offers than your friend. All of that um, is orchestrated through uh, promotions and campaign analytics. Not only do you then run that campaign, but part of campaign analytics, and you'll see it there, is around uh, post campaign analysis, right? So determining whether or not it was any good. And so just to dive deeper into these three areas, customer analytics. So when you think about customer analytics, this is really about supporting the business and product strategy, right? Now this can be used for targeting as well. So targeting specific customers for offers, but normally today we use customer analytics for um, 52 week marketing calendars to understand, okay, well in the next 52 weeks, who should we be targeting with what message um, as well as um, overall business strategy, right? Like. I'll give you an example, demographics, right? If the demographics of your business are, you know, skew in a certain way, whether maybe it skews age-wise. So, you know, maybe you have a lot of millennials or maybe you have a lot of baby boomers or maybe you skew very male, right? All of those things matter, um, especially when you're thinking about your future business strategy. And then you can see common examples of work that we do in that space, customer segmentation, either value-based segmentation, so determining who's your best customers and how much they spend, or um, demographic based, um, as well as many other different types of behavioral segmentation um, that we can do. Propensity modeling. And so, you know, in the program, you guys have seen things like uh, logistic regression. So how do you predict a value um, specifically, uh, whether or not someone's going to churn, right, leave your program, whether or not someone's going to purchase something, um, or whether or not someone's going to um, uh, redeem for uh, redeem this coupon or use this promotion. All of those are propensity models. Um, and then lastly, customer lifetime value, which in customer analytics is usually the pinnacle, which is what is the true value of this customer um, in the future, right? And that that informs how much you're willing to invest in that customer, right? So if someone's customer value is very high, you're willing to invest a lot up front to acquire them, but also over the lifespan of that customer to ensure you don't lose them. But if a customer's value is low, right? If you predict that it's relatively low or it's gonna be low in the future, then you, know, you may not decide to invest significantly in acquisition or if they decide, if that customer is leaving your program so, or leaving your business. So an example would be uh, telecom, right? So if you have a phone bill and you call up your telecom provider and you say, hey, listen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave. And so some providers will say, hey, listen, I got a better deal for you. Let me give you this better deal. And others will tell you, 
See you later, right? And so that's usually determined by some form of customer lifetime value. Product analytics. I'm not gonna go into this in too much depth right now, but price, price elasticity modeling, uh, forecasting and linear nonlinear optimization. I'm gonna have a case study right after this that's gonna talk about these. Price elasticity modeling is basically saying when the price of an item, when we drop the price by $1, or if we put 10 points on an item, how many more of that item are we gonna sell? And that's important because it leads into forecasting, which is you need to know how many of those products to have in store, and you need to know how much money you're either gonna make or lose or trade or how much margin you're gonna trade um, to get additional sales volume. And then lastly, linear and nonlinear optimization. So this is the idea that um, with all your products, you're gonna put different values or different promotions on them. And so there's cannibalization as well as different types of halo effects, right? Uh, everyone's heard the example of you put uh, hot dogs on sale and all of a sudden people are gonna buy buns, ketchup and mustard. And so linear nonlinear optimization allows us to determine what are those impacts um, and how does that impact overall sales and margin. And then the last bucket here, um, promotions and campaign analytics. This is just really talking about, okay, well, once you know who your customers are and once you know what you're gonna sell and how they respond to different types of um, uh, offers, how do you now tie them all together? So you'll hear a lot about recommendation engines and recommendation engines are tying a customer to something. Um, experimental design. So when you don't really know uh, whether or not an offer is gonna work, how do you test it in market to make sure that you you know, don't necessarily roll out this na nationwide offer and you end up losing a lot of money on it or you end up not uh, selling anything. And then lastly, once it's all said and done, how do you measure whether or not um, the promotion was successful? Does that make sense? Those three buckets. And then after this, I'll jump into some case studies. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, does anyone have a question? Okay, I'll keep moving forward. So case studies. So here's a first case study um, that we've done. This is for a uh, quick service restaurant here in Canada. Um, they were, and I'll, I'll kind of start from the left-hand side. So um, this brand was looking to uh, redesign a promotion that they had. It was an annual promotion. Um, and they wanted to return it to incrementality, which basically meant they wanted it to be profitable because it, was no, it wasn't profitable for them. They also wanted to do it digitally. So the approach we took was, and these are some of the analysis that we did. So as you saw in the previous slide, we talked about some of the different types of analysis. And so for this promotion, which is part of their loyalty program, um, we looked at three things. The first was behavioral segmentation. So basically identifying customers um, who the uh, promotion one would resonate with, so people who would actually participate. But the second is then determining from those segments um, what was the right uh, reward or prize for them. So a customer who is based out of, you know, uh, Edmonton, Alberta, is going to have very different um, wants and needs when it comes to pricing than a customer that's based out of Toronto. Um, and so both of those need to be taken into account. So that was a segmentation to determine, hey, listen, what are these types of customers that are out there? The second was around linear optimization. So what we said was, okay, well, now that we know who our customers are and what we think they'd be interested in winning, like prizes, how many prizes can I actually give out? Um, and how rich can some of these prizes be? Can I, can I uh, do it across the country? How long can I run this for? What, what would be the right odds? Does everybody win a prize? Does 50% of the people win a prize? Because if 50% of the people win a prize, um, it's gonna, I, I have to, I basically pay out a lot less than if 100 people uh, win a prize. However, um, for every person that wins a prize, there is a probability that they'll buy something else. Right, so you give someone, let's say a free drink um, and they wanna buy a sandwich. And so that was part of the linear optimization exercise, right? Determining, hey, what are these right, what, what are all these combinations? What's the right number? And the last one, market basket analysis. So this basically says, well, when I do give away that, um, that drink, people in Edmonton buy donuts, people in Toronto buy sandwiches. And this is how many, and this is the probability. And all of that kind of comes together to determine the financial model for this promotion. Now, above this, there's a whole strategic design around the promotion, determining you know, how customers are gonna to react to it, 
um, and determining um, the actual value proposition and the mechanics. This analytics supported the financial modeling to actually then get very, very tactical about what we were doing. Um, and then res results in expected return. Um, you know, I, I can't speak too much to the results on this, but basically um, driving incremental traffic and spend um, from those redeeming customers. And right now uh, things look exactly as we planned and those pieces of analytics. Any, uh, any questions on these? on this case. Something really interesting actually, right about approach, you'll see um, in the quick service restaurant space, it's very complex. People buy things in different day parts, right? So breakfast versus lunch versus afternoon versus dinner, um, as well as different types of uh, items, right? So in quick service restaurants, people are buying soft drinks and you know burgers or um, donuts um, or breakfast sandwiches. And then service modes are, you know, what's the channel that they come through? Do they go through the drive-thru? Do they walk in? Do they order it on Uber Eats? Um, all of those different, all of those things matter. And we take all of those into account when we do our analysis. Uh, Precious, I just have a quick question. How long does the, this whole process take to, to, to be done? Since the, you know, um, seeing the situation, the approach, and you know, starting to implement the the solutions. How long is this the, the whole process lasts? Uh, it took about um, this one. I believe it was about four weeks for the analytics work to take uh, um, to go on. Um, it took about an afternoon to ingest and validate their data. So it's a couple of terabytes of data that we ingested in an afternoon. A lot of it is back and forth with the client, right? So basically, understanding their needs, understanding the requirements, working with them to continuously uh, refine the analysis, right? We always like to make sure that, at least from a client's perspective, that the analysis we're doing makes sense, right? So we're constantly checking in with them and we're constantly, um, you know, recalculating things. Great, and is there a lot of, uh, you know, reassessing and, and you know, uh, maybe uh, changing some of the implementation methods, you know, after the, the, the results, um, after we see the results? Yeah, so usually there's always some re um, residual work that comes out of this, right? So obviously, this is the, this is the, um, the standard set of, uh, of analysis. Um, sometimes they'll want to dive deeper, specifically in segmentation, right? So understanding a bit more about what are those segments or diving deeper into the, you know, the, the cuts of those segments. Um, and then in linear optimization, um, it's really about uh, trying different scenarios, right? So our clients usually want to try different scenarios to see what would be the impact of you know doing this specific action or giving away this prize or giving away more of this prize in this specific region great uh, does anyone have another question okay sorry actually i have a question if you don't mind yeah um you mentioned ingesting terabytes of data um one of the trends that we're seeing in data science is uh there are like language, vision, and audio models uh, that are that are probably going to be sold as like a model as a service. Um, so companies and, and are not going to have the capital because model training costs will increase. So it, it'll make sense to just buy a pre-trained model uh, and use that API sort of thing. And so I'm just curious if you see that having any sort of impact in the uh, marketing analytics space that you play with. Yeah, no, it's a great question. So I'll touch on two components of it. So if you think about it, um, the first component is a framework for standard models. And we actually have one built. Um, it's integrated into our data platform. And so with some of our clients, we have an offering called Analytics as a Service. And so effectively, they would hit our API and get, you know, let's say a churn score. So like a churn score back from their customer base. Now, the second component of that, which was part of your, uh, part of your comment, which was around pre-trained models, in this space, pre-trained models can, you know, they're a double-edged sword, right? So imagine you pre-train a model for grocery, as an example, and let's say it's a churn model. Now that's gonna be very dependent on one, uh, the customer, like, the, like basically where your, your geography is, so whether or not it's urban versus suburban, like a, like a store as an example, whether or not it's a convenient shop versus someone's big shop. Um, but then the second component to that is gonna be around the assortment. Right. So what's the assortment of those stores? What is the uh, what are the items that they sell? Right. So, you know, downtown Toronto, as an example, there's a rabbi not that far from me. Um, like their assortment is quite limited. 
right? And so for them, um, you know, to, for them to use an off-the-shelf churn model that we then also use for like a Loblaw wouldn't really make sense, right? So even though it was pre-trained, because the features would have to be similar, they'd have to sell the same things. Um, there probably are models, and in, there there are in other in other um, industries where pre-trained models can work, like you mentioned, computer vision, because to, like identifying a chicken is always going to be the same regardless of what industry you're in. You're like, hey, listen, when I see a chicken, I want to know that it's a chicken. Um, and so those matter. Um, and usually that's the use case for it. But yeah, in, in the marketing analytics space, um, we've got a framework and not pre-trained models, but models that are um, that the framework is there. Now we've got to usually train it with the client's data, but then we would expose it via API as well for uh, consumption. It's a good question. Makes sense. Thank you. Okay. There's no other questions on this uh, case. I'll go to the next one. Um, so this one is about a, um, a financial institution here in Canada. Um, and you can see that I'll start on the left again. Um, we were engaged by this financial uh, institution to identify um, basically er something called early attrition uh, from their cardholder base. Um, so basically when someone attrites or churns or leaves your cardholder, this is a credit card program, um, they effectively stop spending. But you don't really know, and sometimes they don't cancel the credit card. I don't know, some of you probably have credit cards in your wallet that you've never used for a year or maybe six months, you rarely use. And so effectively, you've actually stopped, you know, you, you're not in their program anymore, you're not using their product anymore. And so that's effectively um, soft churn. You haven't canceled the credit card, but you're just not using it. Or you're using it very, very um, sporadically or not at all. And so this financial institution wanted to identify those customers and then find a way of um, or determine what actually causes them and then have some sort of early identification method, as well as a way to retarget them or target them for re-engagement. And so we looked at um, a bunch of different factors. And so you'll see there on top, there's features. And so those are just a subset of the features, but you'll see it goes from left to right, things like demographics. So age and tenure with that credit card product details, so specifically card type, so differences between the base card, right? So imagine credit cards, you know, if you were with PC Financial, there's like the basic card, there's like the middle card, I don't remember what it's called, um, and then there's the World Elite, right? So there's different tiers of cards. Um, along with engagement, so we had data around web visits. Um, so basically when they went to the website, when they looked at their balance, when they looked at reward offerings, as well as redemption. So what did they redeem for? So they, this credit card had points on it. And so you could redeem for things like travel, non-travel, you can actually redeem to pay off uh, your, your credit card statement, um, a whole host of other features. And then category behavior. So this is around what did they buy? Um, grocery spending, drugstore spending, you can see there are fast food transactions. So the number of transactions. This category behaviors list of features was immense, right? Because not only did we talk about it in the sense of absolute dollars, we looked at it in the last three months, six months, eight months, 12 months. We created basically timeframes for all of these, along with um, uh, custom features. So uh, ratios between how much you spend in grocery versus eating out, things like that. All of that was used um, to predict um, effectively, whether or not someone was attriting or, or leaving the program, as well as uh, a decline in value. So what their declines in value were. Um, and then using all of this data to create a classification model that allows us to score the rest of the cardholder base to see whether or not they were at risk of leaving. Right, so we used this data. We knew about customers who had already left and we took all this data together and then we created a, a propensity model to score uh, the rest of the cardholder base. And then you'll see the expected re results there. So that's a graph of what it looks like, um, their shifts in spend. And then from that, um, we built out a, um, a re-engagement, uh, sort of targeted re-engagement uh, strategy, along with um, basically identifying the signals. So as you see in number two, their ability to determine the most important signals in the prediction, prediction of a decline in cardholder value. And then lastly, uh, the framework to implement offers that target selected behavior. Um, so as someone, and it's specifically around redemptions and spend in grocery, those are two of the, um, you know, some of those key features that drive uh, churn, uh, or at least identification of churn. And so as those change, 
um, we then automatically send out offers and communications on behalf of this financial institution. Any questions on that case? Okay, so I touched on the roles that we have um, in uh, analytics here at Bond, on the types of roles, the types of work that we do. But now I'll get to what you guys are probably really looking for, which is what are the skills required um, to get into this space? I didn't want to get super deep into this. And, you know, as we talked about earlier, you know, the questions around SQL and Python. What I want to do is kind of keep it very simple. Um, at Bond, and I know in a couple of different organizations, we use a case study framework and a case study method um, to interview in the analytics space. And so we actually score for three different areas. And there's actually a multitude of other like scoring matrices or uh, there's a whole competency matrix, but these are kind of the key areas that we look at. The first is around foundational skills. And as I mentioned, basic SQL and data mining is there, right? Do you know the basics of how to write a select statement with a where clause? Right? How can you um, how can you basically subset a set of data so that you can look at, like I mentioned, the average spend by province would be a good one, as well as descriptive statistics and hypothesis testing. So being able to test a hypothesis, right? Do you, if you have a hypothesis about the about the data, can you actually test it? And part of our case uh, test for that. And then the last is problem solving framework. So normally, and as you saw in some of the other in those two cases there, the problems that you get faced with aren't typical. Like they aren't cut and dry, hey, listen, this is my problem, I need a solution. It's very much, here's a big marketing or customer engagement initiative, use analytics to make it better. And so because of that, um, you need to have a set of problem solving frameworks that allow you to target the specific problems that you can use your analytics tools um, to fix. And that's why when you look at technical skills, that first bullet around application of statistical methods, so picking the right tool for the problem. So in your problem solving frameworks, you're like trying to solve this problem. You're figuring out, hey, what are my problems? How can I solve them? And then in your technical, technical skills is about saying, okay, well, based on these problems that I've identified, these are the types of tools. And as I talked about earlier, things like propensity modeling, things like customer lifetime value, things like segmentation, things like price elasticity modeling, all of these are you know, different types of tools. Now, in our, in our case, um, specifically for entry-level roles, you usually don't need to know all of those tools, but you need to know, or at least you need to know how to basically match some problems with some tools. Second bullet point there is around understanding goodness of fit metrics. And this is specifically, and it sounds very large, but in reality it's, hey, listen, you tried to solve this problem with this analytics, did it do a good job, right? So you hear about things like confusion matrix or F scores or R squared, um, but very simple things like return on investment could be one way to look at it. Right? Effectively saying, hey, listen, we did something or we're planning on doing something. How do we know it's working? And then assumption testing, right? So in many different types of analysis, there are some assumptions that you'll need to test, um, whether or not they're business assumptions or whether or not they're the, you know, the five assumptions of linear regression. You need to be able to understand how to test a set of assumptions. You don't need to do the math yourself, but you need to know that they exist. And then soft skills. So, you know, this is predominantly focused in on, and as I touched on their client and strategic analytics teams, really these are the last mile of analytics delivery who are taking those analytics uh, insights and deliver or insights and models from our data science and data engineering teams, and then turning it into tactics and strategy. It means that you have to be good at business communication. Um, you've also got to have an attention to detail. That's some of the things that, you know, specifically on our case that we, we look for. And then that one in the middle there, learning agility. And this is where, you know, some of the guys and some of the folks on my team will say um, in analytics, and I'll touch on this on the last slide, but in analytics, um, being curious matters um, because the space is changing so rapidly, right? There's new models every day. There's new ways of doing things. And so having or demonstrating learning agility. So usually on our case, the case that you get is something that you would, you've never done before. And so most people are starting from scratch or starting from a place where they're like, I've never encountered this type of problem. I've never used this methodology. We specifically pick a methodology that we, we think you've never used. Um, that way we can test for learning agility. Any questions? First is I'm just gonna ask you, uh, you mentioned that uh, things change very quickly in, the, in terms of the analytics. Uh, what do you think are, you know, for maybe the next five years, what the 
what new tools you might be using or what uh, a recent grad or a student should be, you know, maybe start, you know, having a look at now to anticipate the, the change? That's a great question. Um, so if I think about, I don't think there's necessarily a, necessarily a toolkit um, that I would recommend. I think for, you know, specifically if you're in school in one of these analytics programs, I think understanding cloud is super important. And not necessarily all the ins and outs of all the tools within cloud, but effectively understanding what cloud computing is and what you can do in the cloud and why cloud is important because it changes some of the um, the way in which you interact with data and the way in which you build models, right? Compute is all of a sudden no longer expensive. Um, and so, you know, uh, sorry, storage is no longer expensive. And so you're now you're trying to optimize for compute costs. Whereas before, when you were doing it on your laptop or on prem, you only had a finite amount of space, right? You, you had like 10 gigabytes and that was it, or 20 gigabytes. And so you had to be very, um, you had to basically pick and choose what data you brought in. And so data management was very important. Um, but now it's really about compute management, right? How quickly can you build your model, scale it and score something as cheaply as possible? Because in the cloud, you can have massive clusters and massive computing engines that can run your model really quickly, but it's gonna cost you an arm and a leg. Right, and so having an understanding of that is, is important because especially in our world um, where we're, we're using tools um, in the cloud that like so Databricks and Snowflake as an example, um, both of them, if you don't know or if you don't have a, an understanding of it, we usually have to teach you how to use those tools to make sure that they're cost effective and cost efficient. But that would be the, that'd be the primary area, I think tooling. I think when it comes to um, methods and models, um, obviously, there's a lot of work, not obviously, but there's a lot of work today um, around uh, basically understanding the decision making criteria of models, right? So trying to make models transparent. So think about a black box model, right? You've thrown a bunch of data, it spits out a number, right? So, you know, your credit application takes all your data in and says approved, not approved. And you want to know why? It can be very hard. Um, to tell right now. And so there's many methods out there that are working through how do you actually, um, how do we actually tell or how do we actually know uh, what the, what's, what's causing the model to predict that way? Ultimately looking at biases in your models, right? As you try to eliminate those type of uh, unconscious bias or biases that uh, come through the data. So that's what I'd say is an area that at least we're looking at very, um, very deeply. Um, and we're doing a couple of different things. Not only are we looking at those methodologies that allow us to um, interpret and make black box, model, black box models transparent, but right now we also have human in, humans in the loop, right? So our process has a human in the loop to ensure that you know, the, the types of scoring and the types of modeling that we build um, uh, doesn't have that type of bias. Great, thanks for that. Uh, does anyone okay. have another question? I don't want to steal the show just to me. <laughs> okay, I'll go to the next slide. Um, this slide is very simple and I made it very simple because I think it's important. Um, tips for landing your first job in analytics, right? So, you know, I, I kind of, you know, took a brief straw poll with my team and was like, hey, listen, like if I were to give out some advice to, uh, you know, some recent grads or people who are looking to start in analytics, what would my advice be? Um, three things. The first, is finding a side project that you're passionate about. You know, I think I had touched on this before, but curiosity in analytics is key. And so finding a side project or finding an area that you can apply your skills to will be very important, especially if you haven't done it in this space before. It gives you the ability to learn. And so you end up learning a lot about a methodology um, or a modeling process, right? So there's tons of different, you know, not only data sets out there, so Kaggle being one of them or Dunhumby um, has open source data sets, but they also have problems out there that you can actually solve. The second is coding it. So getting a GitHub profile, um, using online data sets, finding code or resources online to run your analysis, actually doing it. And not like the, you know, I. I used to get made fun of a long time ago because of the Titanic data set, how small it is and some of the, you know, the small rinky dink uh, analysis you can do there. But really your analysis should be robust. Think about it as though you're being graded on it in the future. Because when, you know, when a, when a candidate has a GitHub profile, we review it um, and we look for some of those things. We look for you know, cleanliness of code. We look to make sure it's complete. We look to make sure that you didn't, you know, you, you didn't just hack some things together. And sometimes you do at the start, but it's about uh, treating your code as a craft. 
And then the last one, I think that this one's very important, at least for me, is practice explaining it. I think that too many of us in, in this field struggle with explaining what we've done. And the challenge with that is ultimately it's something you're super passionate about and you've been in it for so long. But if someone doesn't understand the reasoning behind it or the insight, then ultimately there's no value that's being generated from it. And for us, that, translate direct, that translates directly to um, interactions with a client, right? So for our clients, they need to understand that, hey, listen, you may have done some amazing analysis. You may have built some really cool models. Your code is amazing. But if you can't explain it, if, we can't, if you can't actually show where the value is generated and what the problem that you were solving was, um, it tends to fall pretty flat. And so for anyone looking to land their first analytics job, these are the three areas that I would recommend, only because you're going to get questions around, tell me about a project you did, right? And so being able to talk about a project that not only you're passionate about, but that you can show that you did the, the heavy lifting and that you can explain the, the problem and the business value, um, I think you end up acing that problem and, or sorry, that question. And I think that that's probably the thing that we look for the most is can someone you know, show passion in this space, show that they have some technical command and then explain it. Tell us why um, it was, a, you know, tell us about your outcome. Okay, so with that, um, wrapping Q&A, uh, any last questions, comments? Is there something that I didn't touch on that you guys wanted me to touch on? If you guys want, you can also chat, uh, uh, tap on the chat box and I can uh, ask Francis the question as well. Hi there, Keith Lou. Quick question. D do I just ask away or? You just ask away, ask away. Okay, great. Um, cool. So i um, interested to learn a bit more about technology and analytics and how they kind of play together. So I know that a few years ago, when it comes to, let's say, technology, um, NLP, you know, like um, OCR, OPP, any of these new kind of acronyms that came up were super excited. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> they were super exciting. And then same thing with kind of analytics as well on, on kind of like the data side of things like Peter Fader and, and his, uh, and his clumpiness model. Those were, kind of, excuse me, those were, whew, those are two kind of really exciting, um, I guess, advancements. What, what's happening today in the market in, tw in 2021, what's kind of getting you excited? That's a good question, Keith. Um, so I think, you know, if I think about, you know, you kind of touched on Peter Fader. I'm a huge fan of, fan of Peter Fader. I, we've used, I've used his work a lot, specifically clumpiness. So thinking about, and for those of you that don't know, Peter Fader is out of the University of Pennsylvania. He does a lot of work in customer um, analytics, specifically around clumpiness. So the idea that the consistency of your purchase matters. Um, in 2021, what's really exciting us today is really around entity embedding. So think about clumpiness, right, as a feature, right? So using clumpiness as a way of categorizing someone like Keith Liu, right? Like your clumpiness could be very high. So you're a very inconsistent customer. But then say like a Darren Olson, like uh, I see that he's on, on the line as well. Like he would be very consistent. Maybe he purchases every, every day, right? And he's extremely consistent. That's a feature that we can use to um, basically segment you. Now, entity embedding takes that a step further. And what we're saying is no longer do we need to know the calculation. So consistency, as an example, we didn't know, don't need to know the calculation for clumpiness, which is, you know, the lawn of entropy, whatever. Now we can basically take all of your purchases, plot it on a plane. So we can actually plot it um, using, um, you, you touched on NLP, but natural language processing. We actually use NLP methods to plot what you purchase. Um, and then we turn it into these, I'm going to now butcher this, but basically we turn it into vectors. Um, and those vectors allow us to um, determine uh, basically new features about you, right? So whether or not you are a vegan customer or whether or not you um, like to only shop in the deli aisle, as an example, all of those things, um, those features, we can now uh, basically generate. Um, using entity embedding, as opposed to having to know them up front, like clumpiness, right? So with clumpiness, you need to know that you were looking for it and then calculate it. Does that answer your question? 
Yeah, that was great. Where can I learn a bit more about this? Uh, NC Embedding. Um, so NC Embedding, obviously, you know, uh, you know, we've got a ton of really smart people on our team. Um, you know, um, there's a gentleman by the name of Gage Sontag. He's, he knows a lot about NC Embedding, um, as well as Graham Crawley. Um, these guys are, you know, some of the experts in this field in, in Toronto. Um, but yeah, you can um, definitely Google it. And I think, you know, some will come up. Um, folks who, are, who have been in the uh, NLP space will also be familiar with it as well. We've used it actually recently with a grocer um, out west who has a very diverse business, right? So they've got food, retail, grocery. Um, they've also got uh, fuel and gas. They've also got an agribusiness, so farm supplies, um, as well as a uh, commercial uh, fuel business as well. And so someone could purchase from many of these different businesses. And so we needed to segment them. And in order to do that, we used uh, entity embedding because we didn't know what mattered, what were the features that mattered, right? Like we couldn't come up with all of these features like clumpiness or um, things like that. Okay, that's an excellent question. Save it for the end, it's exciting. Um, okay, any, any last questions? Uh, I don't think there are any more questions. I So, for instance, I just want to thank you so much for the presentation. I hope that everyone find it very interesting. I, I personally have. Uh, do you want to leave your contact? Can people add you on LinkedIn? Yeah, exactly. Everyone can find me on LinkedIn. You can add me on LinkedIn. Um, free to connect there as well. Um, yeah. Awesome. So thank you so much for the presentation uh, from everyone. If you guys want to keep up with the Analytics Club events, just uh, follow us on LinkedIn, then the groups that I posted here in the chat box. And well, thank you so much for your attention and have a great uh, night, everyone. Thank you.